I don't really believe in any cryptids, though the idea of them is fun, except for Mothman. Around the time of these sightings in mid-fall 2017, I lived in a small town in southeast Michigan, Oakland County, and was attending high school. My older sister, who was nine years my senior and had a similarly timed work schedule, drove me to school extra early every morning so I could attend an extra hour and fit another class into my schedule. It was awful and started at 6 a.m., but we only lived about 15 minutes from my school, so it wasn't all that bad of a drive. One morning we were making our way to the school as per usual through some super curvy wooded back roads by our house, a route we took every day. Suddenly, in a break between the section of road we were on, just between the third curve and the last curve before the road straightened out, I noticed two glowing red spots about maybe 600-800 feet in the distance. At first, I brushed it off as the area was known for deer and the spacing for eyes wasn't too far off, but I couldn't shake the wrong feeling I had. The eyes just weren't the right color to be reflecting deer eyes, and as we neared closer, it became apparent to me that if these indeed were eyes, the figure was far too tall to be any type of animal I could think of. It was still really dark out, so I was only able to make out the eyes and a dark black silhouette before. As our headlights were finally near enough to begin illuminating the figure, it took off into the sky like a literal bat out of hell. It moved incredibly fast, and before it took off, the dark silhouette expanded significantly in a manner that was incredibly similar to how birds use their wings to take off. Before I could hardly register what had just happened, it disappeared over the tree line and out of sight. At first, I was worried I was seeing things, however, as I looked over at my sister. I was met with a mirror of my same shocked expression. She asked incredulously if I had just seen that too, and we began conferring about what we just saw. I was relieved to hear that I wasn't going crazy as she described the same things I had also just seen. I still think about that morning to this day, and was surprised when a couple of years after it, I came across your articles and reports. A lot of the sightings and encounters you compiled dated around the same time. I saw what, I believe more and more every year, had to be Mothman. I've been going through this for a long time. I'm 28 and feeling frustrated, lost and ready to die. Recently, I had an encounter with a person entity that made me realize I'm not crazy. It's important to be careful about what you believe because childhood stories can turn out to be real. These entities are present all the time, often unnoticed. They appear as flickers of light, similar to the sparks when you hold your breath or get hit hard. Their intelligence in observing us is a mistake on their part. It all started when I was a child, always curious and seeking to understand how everything worked. I had knowledge beyond my years, even though I didn't fully comprehend it. The adults knew I was different, they control everything and were caught in the middle of their game. Demons, ghosts, fairies, trolls, Nephilim, and even aliens are real. I've seen more than my fair share of them. I'm dead serious about this, and if you put me on a lie detector, you would know. When I was eight, I discovered a circle mark on my stomach. Months later, I developed a sixth sense, predicting when things would go wrong. I could also sense the emotions of both humans and animals, at the age of 13, I witnessed shadows moving at the end of my bed, and I would become paralyzed with fear. When I woke up, I had a brand on my right hand. At 16, the shadows appeared again, and I woke up with a brand on my chest. This mark stayed with me until I was 18. At 20, my gift of sensing emotions became overwhelming, making it hard for me to go anywhere without having an anxiety attack. At 22, a deep, beautiful voice spoke to me, telling me to search for the golden compass using a golden seal. I couldn't come up with something like that on my own, and I couldn't find any information about it. When I turned 23, I experienced the touch of death when something grabbed my shoulder, leaving me frozen with fear. On July 9th, at the age of 23, I had a terrible feeling that something horrible was about to happen. The next day, my fiancé died in a car accident, drowning upside down in a pool. Since then, the entities that visit me at night have become hostile, 
trying to paralyze me, but I won't let them. I fought against one of them recently and was able to break free. Now at 28, I'm ready to ask for help. People like me with unique abilities are seen as threats by these entities. They have their own plan, and we need to figure out which side we're on. So in the end of August, this guy I was talking to now, boyfriend, 43 male, he wears a size 12 shoe, important later, and I 21 female went fishing. We went to one of our normal spots, a spillway type deal coming off a mountain tucked into a small bowl like valley. There's a really nice little pool there. So we go fishing and it's like 10 p.m. We had seriously just gotten there and set up when a giant rock came flying through the air into the middle of the pool. We hollered out, hey, we're fishing down here. Sorry for disturbing your camping, but we're done setting up and just want a quiet night. We'll be respectful if you will. A second later, another rock came flying through the air and landed two feet from me. We decided to go investigate who is chucking rocks at us. I go and shut off our side by side so there's no lights. We go up to where the rocks seemed to be coming from and didn't see anyone or any footprints. We go back down to our little hole, and I feel someone watching me from each side of the valley. I was starting to freak out, but not going to say anything because I'm a big tough girl. I'm not, but I didn't want to seem like a wimp. Another rock comes flying down into the pool. I clean up my stuff and go to my boyfriend and say I'm leaving with or without you. He agrees to leave and we pack up. I tell him I felt like we were being watched from both sides and he agrees. Well, he was pissed so he goes back to check out where we were the next day. He found where the person was camping and had a stockpile of large rocks to throw at us. Whoever it was dug out a hole to sleep in and my boyfriend found footprints that made his feet look tiny, probably a size 15 and where they were camped, they had a perfect line of sight to us. The crazy thing is we walked right below him and were six feet from him. We never saw him even with our headlamps on and I kept looking in his direction. I do have the pics he sent me, but he has an old phone and won't let me get him one with a better camera. My old man would take my brothers and I hunting out of this little cabin in Colorado. The cabin is way isolated, and I mean this place is a good 30 to 40 miles from the nearest town, and that itself is only a handful of people nestled right in the middle of Nowhereville, USA. To get there you have to go over a mountain pass and take a ton of old dirt roads, but in the end, it's worth it. The hunting is great, the sights are unforgettable, and you are completely isolated. One year my brother, who I'll call Carl, and I decide to play a little prank on our youngest brother, Lou. We have a habit of telling scary stories, and this only increases when we go camping and hunting, because that's just one of the things you do out in the middle of the woods. Carl and I finish telling Lou a particularly frightening tale, and like the loving brothers we are, we start egging him on about all the creepy shit that's probably lurking outside the cabin as we speak. Lou is getting way into it and begins to freak out and our dad has enough of mine and Carl's antics and sends us out to get more firewood. While we're out there, Carl and I devise an even greater prank that'll surely scar our baby brother for life. So like the idiots we are, we start making all these howling noises. Now we're a good 50 yards from the cabin at this point and Carl and I are lying in wait for our little brother to come investigate where we went since that's something our dad would make him do. Sure enough, Lou comes out with a high beam light and starts scanning the area from the doorway to see where we are. Now Lou hates coyotes and we continue to make howling and growling noises while he searches for us. And from what we can see of him, the kid is petrified on the spot as he looks for us. As soon as he passed Carl and I with the light, we jumped out of the darkness and snarled and ran at him on all fours, scaring the living hell out of our little bro. Mission accomplished. Next thing Carl and I know, our dad is in the doorway and boy, our old pops is fuming at this point. He grabs the light Lou had dropped and turns it on us as we're making our way back. I turned to Carl and told him it was nice knowing him, but before our dad goes full Jack Torrance from the shining on our asses, something changed in the way my dad was standing. 
I visibly saw his silhouette sag in the doorway as he looked out into the night, and suddenly he's telling us to get in the cabin as fast as we can. I didn't hear anger in his voice at all. I just remember the fear in his words as he started yelling, Boys, don't turn around. Just get back to the cabin now. Now, now. Carl and I barely made it through the door before our dad slammed it shut and managed to lock it with his shaking hands. He made it to his chair and sat down before facing us and said with the straightest face, Stop scaring your brother. Turns out they planned the whole thing when we went out for firewood. This is my story with the Mothman of Chicago. I genuinely believe this one in particular roosts in bus woods in the western suburbs Rolling Meadows area. I am in a suburb next door. This occurred right at the start of the pandemic in early 2020. Many things were shut and this moonless night was easily the darkest I'd ever experienced in the suburbs. Usually, light pollution means you can see 24-7, but this night was particularly dark and quiet. It was like 2 a.m., and I'm in the garage tinkering on one of the bikes listening to some music, not super loud when there was a crash on the roof of my garage. I've had raccoons jump off the tree onto it before, but this sounded like a person my size just jumped onto it. The whole building shook my garage as an old horse barn, relatively small for a barn but big for a garage and detached and across the driveway. Well, I heard this and I knew it couldn't be a raccoon, but that's what my mind went to. So I grab a shovel and step outside trying to look up, but it's so dark I can't see a darn thing. As I round the corner of the garage into the front part of my yard, which was so dark I couldn't see my neighbor's house, I swear on my life I hear something jump down and land maybe 15 yards in front of me. I can't see anything. I don't remember hearing anything breathe, snarl, growl, or anything like that which you would if you were face to face with a raccoon. They're noisy, so I'm standing there, dead stopped holding the shovel like a walking stick unsure of what to do or even what's happening. I had a very visceral feeling that I was squaring down with something my size though I felt it. I knew I couldn't just stand there and wait to become a victim, I have a mentality that I never will be one. I'll throw the first stone every time. I raise the shovel to my other hand, taking a defensive grip and step forward, only taking one or two steps before I hear three heavy footfalls. Then I hear the fence behind my garage rattle, and then I hear a whooshing sound like a great pair of beating wings. I genuinely believe when I stepped forward whatever was there turned, jumped on the fence and took off flying. I never even caught a glimpse. I was 100% sober, no drinking and I don't do drugs. I was not sleep deprived, I only got off work an hour and a half prior. I think my garage was the only light for miles and my music drew it in. No one and I mean no one else was for a mile in any direction as far as I could tell. As soon as that thing left I shut down the garage and went inside somewhat shaken thinking, holy crap, I damn near got into a fight with something and I don't even know what it was. The reason I think that it was the Mothman and why I think it roosts in bus woods is another story entirely. This is not an embellishment, this is a real event that happened to me, albeit only one time ever. The creepiest dive of my life. Two buddies of mine and I were on a night dive in the Puget Sound hunting prawns. It was about 1 a.m. and we're a good 100 feet deep the pitchest black you could imagine. We used to do this thing on night dives where we'd get in a circle, turn off our lights, then stir up the water and watch the bioluminescence float around us like floating stars in a black watery space. Beautiful. Only this one time we turn off our lights, stir up the water, and the water glows just enough to reveal a fourth person sitting in our circle. We were at a dive resort so it wasn't so odd to see another diver, only it was 1 a.m. we'd seen no one else prepping a dive at the dock. He was also alone, which was odd considering the dangerous conditions of a night dive in those waters, and he had no fins or gloves. I don't know how he swam so well without fins or didn't get hypothermia without boots or gloves. We wore dry suits because it was so cold, but this dude was in a wet suit with exposed skin, 
and we thought we saw a giant gash in one of the legs. So the three of us all notice him and we're too scared to move. I can hear my buddies panting in their regs, and the guy just smiles and waves, then swims away. Whenever you think you're alone and someone just shows up, like in an alley at night, it's weird as F. 100 feet underwater at night is terrifying. The beast was never clearly seen, but around 1992, while hunting a swamp just before dark here in Louisiana, I was stock hunting while wading through knee-deep water. I saw water movement through some very thick hedgerow-like brush. At first, I believed it to be ducks, so I sneaked up to the edge of the brush for a clear shot. But when I got there, I could see movement through the thick brush six feet over the water. And at the same time, there were small wakes in the water coming through the brush every time it moved. I was less than ten feet from this animal, and I could hear it sniffing the air. It suddenly froze still when it picked up my scent. We were frozen in a noiseless standoff for at least two minutes. It couldn't see me, but it was looking for me because it knew I was very close. I knew this was something weird and my situation wasn't good. So while mostly hidden, I slowly and quietly over a minute or so replaced the bird shot in my 12 gauge with three three magnum thousand buckshot. When I raised my gun to ready fire, it saw me. And when it did, I believe it thought that I was closer than it expected because that thing screamed like a wild hog, being killed X-10 very hair-raising loud. It then suddenly leaped several feet out of the water, and about twelve or so feet out into deeper water of about eight, ten feet deep. In that instant, when it jumped, I could see its back, or something slightly above the brush. It had spiked hair. When it landed in the water, it sounded like a three-hundred-plus pound animal splash. It remained underwater until it reached the other side of the slough. When it came out on land, I couldn't see it. I then made a huge circle around the animal to try and cut it off in an ambush. I wasn't really scared because even though it was God knows what, I knew I scared it more. I mean, I sneaked up less than 10 feet of this thing, and it had no clue I was even there until it winded me. Besides, at that range, a 12 gauge with that load of shots is like being shot 10 times with an R15 in one spot. A 12-gauge load like that can put a hole the size of your fist through a wild hog. That's an animal that has one of the toughest hides on the planet. There's nothing on this earth that will survive very long with a rib cage shot from that load at that range. I knew this already, that's why I give chase. Anyway, I tried ambushing with no luck. I wanted to continue hunting it, but all I had was a small pocket light, and it was only about 10 minutes before total darkness. Before I set out of the swamp, I looked and found its tracks. I found canine-like tracks about four or five feet wide and six, seven foot long. They were bipedal tracks set about six feet apart due to the animal running. There's a lot more to the story, but I will leave it at this for now. I gathered enough info about this animal over the years that I'm convinced it can be hunted and killed. It walks on two legs and has canine-like feet, so it's whatever you want to call it. I just know it exists, and I see it more as an animal than a monster. My girlfriend's dad told us he was out moose hunting when they came across three guys from out of state looking to party before a wedding, get drunk and have a good all time. They were loud as F for the next two nights to the point the dad's group went and checked it out. The groom had been tied up and was beaten because he cheated on his bride with one of his friend's significant others. After he was rescued, he told them they held a gun to his head, and he was most likely going to be murdered in rural Alaska. This story almost belongs on no sleep, but I swear it's real. Hiking along a section of the PCT with my aunt and dog after three days, we found ourselves at an impassable river crossing with the dog and have to head back. Reluctant to go over the mountain passes we just did, we pulled out our map and find what seems to be an interesting trail through the Ansel Adams wilderness to that will put us back where we started. We go to a resupply point, got some dinner and a shower, and ask if we can get a four-wheeler right up the road to the trailhead. They say nobody goes up that road and we couldn't get one. 
but a man on vacation with his family offers to help up out. We drive about two miles up the road, and it proves to be so washed out. It becomes impossible to drive further, so we then him for his help and continue on foot. We walk another three miles or so to the trailhead and find it completely destroyed by fallen over trees, and it looks like no one has been there for decades. Turns out this was an old logging road used in that area before it became a wilderness area 50 or 60 years ago. So we start hiking down the, the trail another four miles until we camp for the night. Along this trail we see nothing but bear tracks and deer tracks, no people tracks, horses, or anything. We even stumble on a bear in the middle of taking a dump on the side of the trail and scare him off. From our camp, the road or trail gets really tough. It was about six miles of climbing over giant fir trees one after another. We finally reached an opening and followed it for about another mile until amazingly we couldn't believe it. But we came up on a two-story building way out there in the middle of nowhere, 15 miles from the nearest people and 50 from any civilization. This place was super eerie. The house was straight out of the Blair Witch, and it must have been there since before it became a wilderness area. This where thing got weird. We found a sign here for our trail that pointed directly into thick brush and bushes. This is when we knew we were a little screwed. We decided that we should just go for it anyway. We were too far to turn back now and luckily we had a GPS to help guide us even without a trail. So we go through the bushes and follow what used to be a trail. We get about another mile or so down the trail before I notice barefoot human prints. Let me remind you that I've been seeing bear prints and cougar prints along this trail the whole time. These were human. I put my size 11 hiking shoe over it and they were the same size and shape and asked my aunt if I was going crazy and she agreed it was human. We walked another 500 yards down the trail with human prints, leading us to what looked like either a dump or a homeless camp. There was a tarp strung up, trash bags piled up, and garbage scattered all over next to the creek. Nope, F that. No more investigating this creepy place in the middle of nowhere. We just hiked as fast as we could continuing up the hill and away from that place as possible with the eerie feeling that someone was watching us for miles. We continued the way we did hiking with no trail for another 12 miles until we reached a maintained trail on the other side of the pass, along some really pretty areas that probably haven't been seen in years. But seeing a homeless Bigfoot camp in the middle of nowhere was not one of them. However, when I was younger my father bought a plot of reclaimed coal mines land. It was quite literally in the midst of hundreds of acres of wilderness. Me and my younger brother would play in the woods around our house, and we found some interesting stuff. There was an old wooden wagon that was broken down and rotting that we found. We also found what looked like the remnants of an old cable pulley system with wooden buckets attached to it. The thing that scared me the most happened to me and my best friend at the time. We were outside playing basketball when these shadowy figures appeared at the edge of the forest. There were four of them, and they were completely black except for their eyes. It was like a pin prick through paper that when you shine a light on it, the paper is the shadow and hole is this area of light. That's what their eyes looked like. They knew us by name and called out to us. They were calling us over to them. We ran away into the house and didn't come out for a long time. This happened when I was eight or nine years old, and I guess I repressed it. But I kept having this memory of these shadow people and my friend. At first I thought it was just a dream that I'd had, but the memory was persistent. When I was much older, I believe mid-twenties, I was with my friend and told him that I had a question that I needed to ask him. I told him that it was going to sound crazy, but it happened while we were playing basketball when we were younger. He instantly answered saying the shadow people at the edge of the woods. It completely threw me. He verified that it had truly happened without me really asking about it. It still shakes me to this day when I think about it. I was a field engineer doing software installation and commissioning on telecom equipment controllers. 
These units are located at cell sites tower bases which your phone connects to in order to provide you service and connectivity from your cell service provider. A lot of these towers are in very, very remote places. In this particular project, I would go in the day after the construction crews completed their tower and electrical work. I would be by myself with just my work truck, air card and laptop. This particular site was in rural Virginia. I probably still have the email from when I was on that project with the site's coordinates, so I will try and post those later if I find them. If it's not against policy, of course. The site was about two, three miles into the deep woods of Virginia. It was near a now abandoned mine of some sort. Not sure exactly what they were mining for, but there was very old mining carts and drilling equipment scattered about as I was driving to the site. It was starting to get dark, but this was supposed to be a quick in and out type deal. LTE commissioning usually takes one hour or less, and since I saw a Civil War era cemetery connected to the gravel road which leads to the site, I was in more of a rush than usual. See the thing is, when you try and rush things, especially because of fear, you will F up. And boy did I F up. Something that should have taken one hour took over four. When I finally completed my work and closed my laptop screen, I realized how dark it was outside and that I was all alone at the base of a tower in the middle of nowhere. I quickly gathered my belongings and headed towards my car, which was probably 60 yards away at the gate of the compound where the tower was located. When I tried to close the gate behind me, it was so dark that I couldn't see the chain and lock, so I put my car in reverse, put the e-brake up and shut off the ignition. This way my reverse lights were lighting up the gate for me so I could close it. Just trying to give you an idea of the utter darkness I was in. After all that I headed down the trail to the secondary gate which leads to the site, about half mile from the actual compound. Same situation as before, too dark so had the car in reverse. Well when trying to close this gate I heard in the distance what I can only describe as the most menacing and evil female laughter. It sounded like it was pretty far away, but I got shook to the bone. I left that secondary gate wide open and nope the hell out of there. On the drive out I remembered the cemetery I had to drive by. Needless to say I didn't look at it when drove past it on the way out. After speaking with the construction crew that built the site, they also said they heard people whispering in the woods at night, but could never spot anyone. They also heard what sounded like people picking at rock with tools, but they were certain no other construction or anything was taking place anywhere for miles on end. I am in the U.S. Coast Guard, and I recently was assigned to a ship. I was going through our log books to look up something and noticed that on the bridge a unknown blue light was observed beneath the water's surface the night before. This intrigued me so I started looking through more of the logs. Apparently every two, three weeks they enter lights of varying colors in places you would not expect. Usually white, red or green lights are on the horizon or in the sky ships and aircraft. But they seem to report colored lights under the water, sometimes moving around, sometimes stationary. Lights in the sky moving at extreme speeds then immediately stopping or disappearing altogether. Sometimes lights are visible to the naked eye, but when we try to look at it with FLIR or night vision, they are undetectable. I was in high school that time and right in front of our house, there was a secluded park. That park is empty and peaceful, but it gets crowded at a certain time of the day because of dog owners. So my dogs are not friendly and because of that we take them out a little bit early than others. Like usual, I checked the park out from window, and there was just a man walking around the park. I took my two dogs Golden Retriever and Yorkshire Terrier and went to park. I was listening to music and waiting for my dogs do their thing. I realized that bald and middle-aged man was glancing at us, but he was keeping a distance. I usually know everyone that comes to that park but it was my first time seeing that guy. I am a paranoid person and wanted to go, but my small dog were still looking for a place to poo-poo. When my dog was sniffing around, we had to stop walking. That guy got close to us and said, 
I have a friend and he will bring two aggressive pit bulls here. You should get out. I was surprised and just said eight and got out. Didn't even question and walked out of the park. We could see the entire park clearly from our windows. I almost knew all the dogs that hang around in the park and even know their personalities. I never saw or heard about pit bulls nearby. After some time passed, no one was coming to the park. That man was walking kind of wobbly and talking to himself. He was holding some kind of small bag in his hand, and he was smelling that bag. We just understood immediately, but we were quite amazed by his trick to get me out. After some minutes, a grandpa and his grandchild were walking the hallway to park. That guy didn't even wait them to enter and ran to them and yelled like a crazy. That poor old man was scared a lot. He didn't say anything and just left immediately. We were fine with him getting high in our park up until now. He took a thick tree branch and ran after cats. I got even more mad and made my mom call the police. They arrived 30 minutes later. That crazy guy walked on the police too. They took him and we didn't see him that day. After a winter, we saw him again. We were like, ugh, here we go again. It was our dog's toilet time again. I was studying to my exams and asked my mom to take them out. There was also a gardener and some kids in the park. She decided to go because she was not alone with him. Dogs did their thing and she was just going out. She was just about to leave he walked on my mom and raised his arm. But thankfully he was so wobbly. He couldn't get much close. The gardener was just watching from the corner. She screamed a little and went back home. He got taken by polices for three times, but he always got back on summer days. My dad was a merchant sailor. He has seen and done some shit. Some things he still won't even tell me. Apparently there was this crew once probably more than once that included this crazy guy that slept with a hatchet, who was one room over from my dad, and also a guy who everyone hated. One day they woke up, and the guy everyone hated was missing. There was some blood around one of the portholes. The way my dad puts it, you can't fit a grown man through one of those portholes whole. I've tried, so probably murder, and no one gave a shit. I've been a small town police officer in the quiet corners of Kentucky for as long as I can remember, but nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered that fateful night. It was a night that would forever haunt my dreams and make me question the very fabric of reality. The call came in just after midnight, a chilling whisper in the dark that sent shivers down my spine. Someone unknown had dialed 911 their voice trembling as they reported something weird happening at an abandoned underground facility on the outskirts of town. It was an unusual call for our quiet little community, but we were obligated to investigate. I arrived at the scene, the headlights of my squad car slicing through the Inkai blackness of the night. The facility loomed before me, a foreboding structure that had long been forgotten by the world above. I could feel a palpable sense of unease as I approached, like the very earth beneath my feet was trying to repel me from its depths. The entrance was an old, rusted door that groaned in protest as I pushed it open. The air inside was heavy with the scent of dampness and decay, and a dim, flickering light barely pierced the darkness ahead. I cautiously descended the stairs, my hand resting uneasily on my holstered weapon. As I delved deeper into the facility, I began to uncover the disturbing truth. The rooms were filled with eerie equipment, strange contraptions, and a grotesque array of medical tools. My heart sank as I realized the nature of the experiments that had taken place here. Human subjects, their faces contorted in agony, lay scattered across the floor, like the victims of some twisted, macabre ritual. The dread that had been building within me began to escalate as if the very walls of the facility were closing in. I felt an oppressive presence, a malevolence that seemed to seep from the very walls themselves. I knew I was not alone. On one occasion, I stumbled upon an encounter that would forever be etched in my mind. In the dim light, I saw a large, dark figure walking upright in my direction. 
It was black, a bit shorter than I, with no visible neck that I could see. Its head was oddly shaped, sniffing the air with its nose pointing up. I could not see any visible eyes. I was rooted to the spot in fear, unable to physically move a muscle. The creature sensed my presence, and in a sudden blur of motion, it lunged at me with unnatural speed. We tumbled to the ground, and in a panic, I unholstered my weapon and fired. The gunshot echoed through the underground chambers, but I missed my mark, the bullet harmlessly embedding itself in the wall. Fear coursing through my veins, I managed to scramble to my feet and flee the scene, my heart pounding like a drum. I raced up the stairs, through the echoing corridors, and out into the cool night air. Once outside, I called for backup, my voice trembling as I recounted the horrors I had witnessed. My fellow officers arrived swiftly, their flashing lights illuminating the facility's entrance. But as we cautiously re-entered the facility, the creature was nowhere to be seen. It had vanished, leaving only a trail of dread in its wake. We combed every inch of that facility, but there was no sign of the mysterious creature. The experiments, the inhuman suffering, the malevolent presence, it was all very real, but the entity that had haunted me remained elusive. As I stood there, breathing heavily, I knew that the nightmares of that night would never truly leave me. It's one of those nights that I can never forget. I was dispatched to a call about an erratic driver, but it sounded like the call was taken by mistake. There wasn't any description other than suspect operating vehicle erratically, so I figured it must have been for somebody else. When I got up to the area, though, there he was, the suspect himself, driving down the road as if nothing had happened. I pulled out after him, trying to get his attention with my sirens and lights, but he didn't budge, not at all. Until almost half a mile later when he finally moved over into the right lane, stopped on the shoulder facing me head on. He sat there in his car, completely still. I got out of my car with my flashlight and shone it on him. His expression was blank, like he didn't even see me there in front of his car. I didn't want to make any sudden movements in case this guy was dangerous, but at the same time, I felt like he wasn't going to do anything because he stopped himself. So I took a few slow steps toward him while my other hand hitched over to where my firearm is kept just behind the small of my back inside a cross-draw holster. He still made no movement whatsoever, so I took another step forward and then thought, this might be the only chance I get. I jumped into his vehicle through the open window, put one hand on his shoulder and another on his head. I tried to pull him off the window, but it's like he was stuck, like he was glued there. He didn't even try to resist or anything. Then I saw it. This massive gash on the side of his chest, like something straight out of a horror movie. It was deep too, right down to the very bone. Lacerated flesh flapping in the wind against the jagged edges of exposed ribs, as if somebody had just hacked into him with an axe. It wasn't bleeding though. In fact, the blood seemed coagulated. It made me think, is he not human at all? There were no other injuries anywhere else on his body either so it didn't appear to be from some kind of accident. I left the guy sitting there because he was completely unresponsive, but I couldn't find any signs of blood. There were definitely marks on his body, though. They all pointed to the same thing. He had clearly been in some sort of hostile situation. I just called this in as a hit and run, left the car where it was, and tried to follow it. I called in an ambulance to get him medical attention. When the ambulance showed up, they too were shocked by his state and surprised by the fact that he was not dead. Although in checking his vitals, his temperature was 70 degrees, and his blood flow seemed to not be really going much at all, meaning he had very low blood pressure, and his heartbeat was abnormally low. But he was still clearly alive enough to operate a vehicle. Talk about disturbing. It still really bothers me when thinking back. I mean, how often does this sort of thing happen? And seeing something like that, it really just sticks with you. It's very haunting. Hare hunting with my dad's family in Macedonia and some hills. 
We found a pair of relatively fresh tracks. We're getting closer to them when we start hearing crashes from what sounded like two massive animals. The hare tracks led into a clearing and we reached a bush to peek out. No shit, there were two wolves having a go at a bear. One of them got swiped and its left side torn open. The other nipped the bear on the front right paw and left. The other wolf died soon and the bear left. Once we were sure it was gone, my uncle put the wolf down and its head still hangs in his house to this day. Also we shat ourselves and no hares were hunted that day. When I was a teen I used to go off-roading or mountain biking in the big forested parks in my suburban town. I had been gone for a few hours and was nearing the farthest end of the park. It was starting to get late and I was deep in the muddied secluded trails. I turned a sharp corner on part of the trail and saw a man disheveled, maybe in his mid-forties or fifties just standing there. I was surprised and it stopped me in my tracks about ten feet away from him. The trails were really narrow and for me to turn around in the dense woods would leave me vulnerable to this guy if he decided to jump me or something. So I just stood there for a minute. We both looked at each other blankly. I said, hi, can I get past you please? He didn't say anything for about another minute. Then he spoke, would you like a blowjob? Needless to say I backed up really fast, spun my bike around, called him a creepy mother F and rode off. rabbit hunting at a fairly young age. We would take our beagle out to a farmer's land on Saturday mornings. Usually we would split up and just walk along somewhat shadowing the dog on either side. Sometimes we would kick up a rabbit and call the dog over, or she would find one herself. So on days with not many rabbits we would end up walking a couple of miles in before turning around. On one such day I stumbled on a clearing with a pile of hair at the edge. At first I thought it must be some animal fur, but then I realized it was spread all around the edge of the clearing and scattered around in the clearing as well, and also appeared to be human hair. Having no clue what I had found other than a shit ton of human hair a couple of miles into the woods, it was pretty creepy. Turned out I had stumbled on someone's harvested marijuana crop. The hair is used to keep animals away, so ended up not so creepy. Tanzania dawn. We're on a platform that we built in a tree overlooking a carcass of a hippo, waiting when the king of jungle would come for its morning feast and our perfect shot. Suddenly our PHR guide, or professional hunter, silently points backwards, pale, with a drop of sweat coming down his head while looking straight ahead. I look back and see a pair of eyes about five meters from me sitting on a branch, the red sky gently reflecting in its pupils. A leopard. Now leopards don't look intimidating comparatively to a lion or tiger per se, but what makes them so intense is the fact that they always finish what they start. If they pick a target to pounce, the target is done for. What a leopard does is it jumps and hugs you with its claws, gently bites you in the neck, and then starts going apish it with its feet right at your abdomen. We're about 1,000 miles from the closest hospital. I am also the youngest, the natural target. Fortunately, the story ends in a rather boring fashion. The leopard looked at us for a little bit and just said F these guys and left. I've never been one to dwell on the supernatural or the unexplainable, but there are moments in life when reality blurs with the inexplicable and you're left questioning the very fabric of existence. What I'm about to recount is one of those moments, a chapter from my time as a Special Forces soldier working alongside the CIA, deep within the heart of Mexico. Our mission was anything but routine. We were tasked with infiltrating a top-secret government facility known as Project Spectre. It was supposedly a biolab, but the secrecy surrounding it was suffocating. Our journey through the shadows of this underground complex would forever etch horrors into my memory. As we navigated the labyrinthine passages of the facility, the oppressive air seemed to weigh us down. 
Our team had dealt with cartel members earlier on our way in, but nothing could have prepared us for what awaited us deep within the bowels of Project Spectre. The complex was a maze of sterile white walls and cold, metallic surfaces. We passed by strange surgical apparatus, each more horrifying than the last. Our senses were on high alert, every creak of a door and distant, eerie hum amplifying our unease. Then, on one occasion, as we ventured further into the facility, we encountered something that defied all reason. It appeared suddenly, like a specter emerging from the shadows, and the sight of it sent chills down my spine. The creature had a pale, human-like hand with large claws and skin that glistened like glass, as though it were covered in a clear, viscous liquid. Its face was a grotesque mask of milky white skin, with eyes that were an unnatural shade of blue, veins pulsating beneath them. Its long, serpentine tongue darted in and out of its gaping maw, the only thing in motion other than the trees swaying outside in the wind. But what truly terrified us were its antlers, dark as mold, rising like twisted branches from its massive, deer-like humanoid frame. It must have stood at least seven to eight feet tall, a nightmarish fusion of man and beast. The creature's appearance was beyond comprehension, and before we could react, it lunged at us with a feral roar that sent shivers down our spines. We opened fire, our bullets finding their mark, or so we thought. The creature seemed unfazed, its glassy skin deflecting our shots, and it tackled us with a force that was otherworldly. We fought with every ounce of strength and determination, but the creature was relentless. Its antlers scraped against the walls, and its grip was unyielding. It seemed to have no purpose other than to sow chaos and terror. In the end, the creature vanished as quickly as it had appeared, leaving us battered and bewildered. We searched every corner of the facility, but there was no trace of the enigmatic being. It was as though it had slipped back into the shadows from whence it came. As I recount this harrowing tale, I know that there will be skeptics who doubt the veracity of my story. But I assure you, it is a true account of the horrors I witnessed in the depths of Project Spectre. The scars, both physical and mental, serve as a chilling reminder that there are forces in this world that defy explanation and reason. Some secrets are better left hidden, and some horrors are better left unspoken. While working as a park ranger, I had an experience with the supernatural. It was a scary ordeal, I must confess. A group of hikers had gotten lost in the woods, and my fellow rangers and I had decided to scout out the area. We got the general direction from the report that was made by their own families. Heading off in the direction, we drove until we got to the entrance of the woods, where they at last made contact with their families, according to the report. We parked the car just outside the woods and proceeded to search for them. We had searched for a better part of the day without anything to show for it. It was late in the evening already, and we had walked deep into the woods. I was feeling uneasy with every step we took. It was as if there was a terrifying monster hidden within the woods. A sense of terror suddenly engulfed me, making me break out in cold sweat. I glanced at my colleague, who seemed to have sensed nothing as his expression was as usual. I could not put my finger on it, but something eerie was happening in the woods. Suddenly, we began seeing strange markings words written in an unknown language, different depictions on trees. What was strange was the fact that my colleague, for some reason, was unaware of everything. It was like he was in another dimension, detached from his surroundings. It was in that moment that it hit me, a dimension. Had he mistakenly stepped into a dimensional portal? Was that how the hikers had gotten lost? Had they stepped into it as well? If they had, that would explain the disappearance and why we were unable to find traces of them. It was, of course, a mind-blowing theory, so I wanted to test it out. I moved closer to my colleague, attempted to touch him, but my hands went right through him like he did not exist. I could see him, but couldn't touch him. I called out his name, hoping to get his attention and alert him to the danger we were in. I called out his name several more times, even radioed him, Yet he continued walking deeper into the woods like a puppet on its string, being pulled. 
After my futile attempts, I proceeded to search for the missing party on my own. I came across so many skeletons and bones piled up into a small mountain. At this point, the terror in my heart had reached its peak. I resisted the urge to scream. I beat a hasty retreat and stepped on numerous bones in the process. What scared me was that the bones did not let out the usual crunch sound after being stepped on. Rather, they simply crumbled into dust. I could not help but wonder how long these bones had been buried there. This took my mind to the missing hikers. Were they already bones, or were they alive like me? Terrified and hopeless, I was at my wit's end already, and I could not help but feel despair. I glanced at my wristwatch to check the time, but what I saw shocked me. Time moves faster here. I had barely spent two hours in the woods, yet my wristwatch was displaying a date that was two days ahead. Two hours equal two days here. At this rate, my lifespan would run out before whatever was lurking around would kill me. At this point, all I had in my mind was how to escape this hellhole that I had somehow gotten myself into. All thoughts of searching and rescuing the lost hikers did not cross my mind. At this point, all I could think of was how to get out of my situation. My mind was in chaos, disoriented, and I could not think straight. Just when I thought things could not get any worse, I began hearing voices, and the feeling of being stalked overwhelmed me. I could feel something or someone watching me, and the thought of that made me panic. There was nothing scarier than the unknown, especially in a place such as this. I kept on walking, and my nerves were taut and on edge, ready to react to any situation. I moved on without a sense of direction, hoping to luckily find an exit or something. Glancing at my wristwatch, I saw to my utter dismay that I had spent close to a week now trapped in this place. While I was aware that time was moving faster, things would be different as long as I found an exit. It did nothing to comfort me. I had no idea when I would find an exit out of this dimension. By the time I had spent a couple of months, I threw a stroke of luck. I was able to find a way out. The moment I stepped out, my walkie-talkie buzzed incessantly. People had been trying to reach me and even my colleague. I radioed my colleague, but got no reply. I knew he was still trapped in there, and there was no hope for him to get out. He was not even aware. My story caused a sensation, and I was rushed to the hospital for tests and examinations. The doctor confirmed that my cells had gone through rapid aging. My cells had grown older than they should have. I would have to be placed on a special diet to prolong my lifespan. A few weeks later, the missing hikers were found. However, all of them had lost their youthful appearance, which further boosted the authenticity of my story. Despite getting intensive medical care, all hikers died mysteriously afterwards. My colleague disappeared, and I was told to keep quiet. The entire case was shut down before the press could even get out and no public knowledge ever became aware. I spent about six months last year essentially volunteering on organic farms in exchange for room and board. One of the farms I stayed at was actually an off-the-grid homestead near Mount Hood, Oregon, populated by shamanic hippies who had some wild stories themselves. And while not remote, was deep enough in the mountains that we had no neighbors for at least 10 miles in every direction. Beautiful forested land with an amazing view of Mount Hood from the garden. I was camping every night for about two weeks before weird things started happening. The first bizarre occurrence happened not to me, but to a fellow friend who I'll call Jay. Now, I am not particularly outdoorsy. I grew up in the woods in North Florida and spent my formative years getting lost in places I shouldn't be, but I don't have a great deal of camping experience and only the most basic survival skills. I am comfortable in the woods, but only until sunset. Jay, a true outdoorsman, had been a forest ranger in the Alaskan bush for two years prior and frequently went on weeks-long solo backpacking trips. He had shown up at the farm a few days after me and had set up camp over a mile further down the mountain than I had, which I initially thought was a dickish move but later came to appreciate because he played his harmonica at all hours and nobody needs to hear that shit. 
He was a slow-talking Minnesotan that favored all things logical. One morning, we met up for breakfast, and he asked me if I had heard all that screaming the night before. I hadn't. He told me that he had been laying in his tent with his headlamp on, reading a book when he heard a deep, rumbling scream just outside his tent. He turned his lamp off to listen more closely and realized that his entire tent was illuminated from the outside, as if someone was aiming a floodlight at it. In the few seconds after he turned his headlamp off, two things happened in rapid succession. The screaming cut off as if someone had flipped a switch, and the light from outside clicked off. He listened for footsteps, but heard nothing. After a few moments of silence, he turned his headlamp back on and left his tent to investigate, because I guess he had never seen a horror movie in his whole Gotham life. He said that there was nothing in the clearing and no movement from the surrounding forest, even though he hadn't heard anything leave. And the scream had been very close to, if not within, his camp. Then he apparently shrugged to himself and went to sleep. Or maybe he passed out in fear and was too much of a man to admit it. He told me this over breakfast and I was horrified. He said he'd never heard an animal that sounded like that and could not explain the light except that maybe a hunter had found their way onto our land. But then where did they go? He listened for footsteps and heard nothing. He didn't seem worried, just a bit perturbed. It was very Minnesota of him. Everything was quiet for a few weeks after that incident. Jay left for another farm and I remained in my old campsite, only about three quarters of a mile down from the main cabin. I was comfortable in my tent and no longer jerked awake at broken twigs or animals moving through the brush. I was very proud of myself look at me, an outdoors woman. Which was, of course, when the screaming started. I was laying in my tent, just on the edge of sleep when it started. It was a deep, low roaring. Unlike any animal I knew to live in the mountains in that region. I consoled myself by saying it was an injured black bear, a messed up wolf, some kind of Lovecraftian mutant elk. Then, from farther down the mountain, something else began screaming, answering. The two whatever shrieked at each other for the better part of an hour. I laid in my tent, trying to psych myself up to hike back up to the main cabin, but couldn't quite commit. I laced up my boots and put on my headlamp in case I had to make a run for it. Eventually, the screaming stopped and I somehow managed to sleep. I woke up somewhere around 4 a.m. to something very large shuffling in the bush directly behind my tent. I laid in the dark and listened, absolutely terrified. Elk bear, it was too large. I could hear it ruffling branches of trees at least six feet off the ground. I heard it take a step, and then another. Bipedal. Human. Hunter. A hunter would never be as loud as this thing was and I seriously doubt they would disturb an obvious campsite. Besides, in the month I'd been on the homestead at that point, I'd never heard a gunshot. I'd never seen anyone other than the people I was working with this far up the mountain, for that matter. I laid there, considering my options. It moved slowly, like it was picking through the bushes behind me. Which, in retrospect, of course it was, I'd camped right next to Wild Blackberry. I laid and listened and waited for a long time, almost until sunrise. It was moving slowly down the mountain. I laid in my tent long after the noise died out. When I finally managed to rally my nerves and leave my tent, the brush behind my tent was obviously disturbed. I thought about investigating, looking for prints, droppings, but decided I'd rather just repress the whole thing and deal with it when I was far, far away from these woods. At breakfast, I asked my host, Anne, about the screaming. She was delighted that I'd had a run-in with the forest people. She said that years ago when they'd moved onto the land, the forest people would get into their garden and make a mess of things, so she'd started leaving baskets of produce for them as a sign of goodwill. They'd left the garden alone since. Then I camped out for another week before it got too cold, and I moved into the main cabin, and never heard anything weird again. Pretty anticlimactic, but I guess real life usually is. Still very bizarre and interesting. As a lifelong student of all things esoteric, it verified a lot of suspicions I had. Mostly that weird shit happens in the woods. It's also pretty telling that everyone I met in the Cascades, 
Granted, most of them were of the shamanic, metaphysical persuasion had a Sasquatch story. There were a few other strange things about that place, but this story is by far the most interesting. Oregon is a weird, wonderful place. I'm a police officer, so I had just finished my shift and was on my current way home. I had stopped off at Wendy's to grab a quick bite to eat. It was right around midnight, so the drive through was pretty dead. As I went through the line, I saw this thing just standing there, watching me from across the parking lot. Not sure what it was, but it looked really tall and skinny, with gangly arms and legs hanging out. It gave me this very uneasy feeling, and I watched it as it turned and walked away over to some shrubbery behind one of those big light poles by the parking lot exit and entrance. I try not to think too much of it and just drove away. There's just something about what I saw that still really spooked me. I feel very unsettled in my stomach just thinking back to it. As I was getting home from work, I was still shaken up. I could not stop thinking about what I saw, so I decided to show my son and daughter 8 and 10, who were getting ready for bed, about what had rattled me so badly. Not that I could actually show them, but at least tell them. My kids kind of just looked at me like I was crazy, but being kids, I found they would believe me a lot more than my wife would. Then they started telling me about Slenderman, which sounds like it might be what I saw. But I don't know any of these creepypasta characters kids watch nowadays. Could you kindly give me any information on what do you think I saw? And was this paranormal or not? I suppose it is expected that anybody who chooses to follow in the footsteps of smoking the bear would be possibly stuck in a few scary situations. That certainly was the case for me as I spent my nights working alongside park rangers on some of the most dangerous and terrifying trails in the States. It's not what one might think about being a ranger, though. We don't spend every day sitting around watching deer graves or children play in the playgrounds. Instead, what happens behind those locked gates is something more akin to horror movies than a picnic. If you manage to find your way through these wooded corridors without being eaten alive by some wild animal or eaten after by a bear, you could end up with some serious psychological damage. As my first summer as a ranger was coming to an end, I decided that I wanted to spend one last night in the woods alone. Not many rangers do that kind of thing anymore. But for me, it was sort of this cleansing ritual. My girlfriend had just broken up with me at the time, and I needed time to work through that emotional trauma. I knew there were other people who understood my pain. They would be likely willing to talk about the world ending when we got close enough in proximity. But every man needs his space from time to time, even if he is working within the confines of the law. To be honest, I wasn't really sure where to expect to be out there in the woods with no one else around. I had been alone quite a few times before, but never running into any real trouble. But this time, my mind was racing through the worst-case scenarios, and it almost felt like fate that I would get caught up in some kind of adventure by myself. Either I was going to find somebody who could relate to all my situations, or perhaps even fall for them as they helped me do it all. Anyway, I made it to the trailhead, and then Julian began hiking down towards it to my favorite spot at Lake Oroville State Park. The entire park is beautiful, located not far from Sacramento, but until you are actually standing deep within its borders, you can't truly grasp its beauty. I loved watching the weather rolling over the water, feeling the cold air as it rushed past my face and into my lungs, waking me up from a lazy afternoon nap. I felt at peace with myself every time I visited this spot, but not so much that other people bothered me. That's why this was almost certainly going to be a good night. I just crossed over one of the small bridges leading across the lake when I heard something rustling behind me, more similar to low growls than anything else, really. It sounded like something was stalking towards me, perhaps a bear. The only thing about these sounds that didn't scream bear were its frequency. They were more sporadic than I would have expected. My ears picked up this distinct sound of footsteps more than once, actually, as if somebody were running towards me directly through the thicket. 
Not wanting to meet with whatever was out there on my own terms, I scrambled for one of the trees and threw myself up into it to try and hide. Unfortunately, jumping back had cost me more time than I realized, and by the time that I reached around and grabbed hold of a branch, something hit me hard right in the side. You know, it feels like forever before I felt like landing against something soft and squishy. It wasn't exactly warm or inviting, so all of those other feelings must just be an illusion brought on by adrenaline. It only took a single moment for me to realize what had been happening, that I had been wrapped at the ankles, waist, shoulders, and neck in some kind of netting. I didn't know what exactly it was made out of, but it wasn't rope. It was some sort of binding material. My hands were then completely immobilized by entanglement as well, so there wasn't much I could do other than struggle against my bonds, a dead-end endeavor if there ever was one. Now, the first thing I noticed when I could finally see again is it was completely dark around me. All light coming from behind with only blackness ahead. Two dim lights appeared along the walls on either side of me and began approaching slowly. As my eyes now adjust, they were really more like natural animal eyes than any sort of man-made illusions. Even worse, I noticed that the blackness ahead of me wasn't really coming from a lack of light at all. Instead, there appeared to be some kind of organic wall blocking up my view, spreading out across the room to each side. I had no idea how large this place was, but it must have been bigger than what I could see. One behind me and another in front of me, they made themselves known. Moments later, footsteps. The noises were too far away for me to make out at first, but then I could hear they belonged to something, and more than two. Now, at this point, fear began gripping my heart as I lashed out against my binds once again, only to find that they hadn't been loosened in the slightest. More so, I thought, we'll get to that in a moment. I was hauled from my small prison by several sets of long, clawed hands that dragged over what appeared to be some kind of altar. It was much different from one of those sacrificial altars appearing to be used in ancient times for rituals. The ones to appease unworldly beings were said to lurk within the space between two worlds. But this one seemed more like a place where people got together for satanic worship or other unholy activities. These beings holding me lured me down onto it and began weaving this sort of flower all around me while chanting something in this ungodly language. I was so terrified, I swear I could have had a heart attack. I could make out all the words, but I had no idea what this thing was or what they were saying. The entire group of these things began chanting in unison as they surrounded me, continued weaving more of this plant material around me. It felt like forever before they finally got to the last one. All I could do was just lay there on my back, completely immobilized by flowers, while these creatures circled around me once and turned their backs towards me. The chance stopped abruptly, and every creature but one turned to leave. The remaining one tossed this mask aside, revealing a set of devilish features underneath it. What I had been dealing with looked like a combination of wild, feral human beings and kind of goblinish people. You know what, it kind of reminded me of the trolls or orcs in Lord of the Rings. Humanoid, terrifying looking, but also not human. That's what they reminded me of. It stood there, shaking its head from side to side slowly with its arms raised upward as I tried to break free. Again, I cannot reiterate how terrifying this was. I had no idea what was going to happen, and I was convinced in that moment I was about to be sacrificed by some sort of underground dwelling creatures. I was so scared beyond belief. Then, this thing pulled its arm down after shaking its head and walked away. Completely immobilized, I tried my best to get out of my entrapment, and I believe it was the massive amounts of adrenaline exploding through my entire being that allowed me to break free. As I did, though, I could hear these things coming back, and I knew I had to escape as quickly as I could. Once fully free, I started to run for it, escaping in just a matter of time, feeling my way out of this black, organic labyrinth. I don't know if I was in a cave or what this was, but as I reflect back on these memories, I had so much flooding through my mind. I feel like I kind of blacked out. I don't really know if I remember much after that, but I do distinctly remember collapsing on the ground and being found later on. I know that's probably very anticlimactic, 
But when the human body endures that kind of traumatic stress, it does things to the brain that aren't exactly normal. Anyway, I was treated at the hospital, ultimately taken back to the station and sent home. I didn't actually believe what I experienced at first. I thought it was some crude nightmare or horrible hallucination. But it wasn't until later that I realized it must have been something that really happened, because I actually had binding marks around my ankles, my thighs, my waist, and my wrists. Those bindings were on tight, and I must have wiggled free enough that I loosened them. Like I said, whatever the bindings were made of, they were this crude rope vine material. I've never seen it before in my life. None of them really believed me, though, when I actually got a chance to describe what happened. They thought I was either making it up or just had a bad nightmare. As you can probably bet, this incident has been difficult for me. At any rate, this is my story, and I hope you can get enjoyment from a real-life traumatic event. I don't care if you believe me, and if you choose to read this, which, by the way, you have permission to, I don't care if your readers believe me. I know there's something out there that lives underneath the ground, something that isn't quite human. God, I really want to tell this to people. So a few months ago, my girlfriend and I went to a public state park. It is not like a middle of nowhere, but still not many people around, and it was in the afternoon that a strange thing happened. When we were heading out of the park, we saw a car that was traveling on the opposite side toward us. Then the car turned right, it was a sedan. We thought there was a road right there. And when we got to the section where that car turned, we didn't see any road, but only high grass and big trees. I asked my girlfriend, did you see that red car just now? I thought it turned right around here. She said, I saw a car too, but it was white, wasn't it? We look at each other's for a few seconds and quickly left that area. That was weird. Visiting a friend in California. My last night there and we're talking about how I hadn't seen any redwoods. So we hop in the car at 11 o'clock at night and head off to some forest trail that he knows. We get there and there is a gate with a sign on it which we don't read. He's carrying his toy poodle. We walk a little ways, but the trees aren't that big. He says they get bigger further in and sparks up a joint, and we keep walking. Maybe a half mile in, we hear the loudest scream I have ever heard. We stop and looked at each other, and my friend says, I think someone just got murdered. We stood there for a few minutes to see if we heard anything else, and then we heard it again. It seemed to be closer, but it was tough to tell as it was echoing. Still no clue what it is, but we decide we should probably get out of there. Didn't really think much of it afterwards until I read an article about a mountain lion stalking someone, and there was audio of the sound mountain lions make. I send the link to my friend saying I think we are lucky to be alive. He laughs and says, You know I was up that way recently and noticed that the sign on the gate is a warning for mountain lions in the area. I was fishing in this little pond in the woods near my buddy's house. I heard a growling from across the water, but it was a really deep growl. I look up and I saw what can only be described as a Sasquatch. It was looking right at me from across the lake, which is about 100 feet away. Then it dropped on its belly and, I want to say, crawled away because that was the motion. But it was super fast. Reminded me of a liquor from Resident Evil. I literally peed my pants and whimpered a little, and was in shock for a moment. I never told a soul because who would believe me? This happened to my grandfather years ago. I guess he was out hunting and walking around in some woods, maybe five miles from a main road near where my family settled north of Pittsburgh. He said that he started seeing these burnt-out candles and started picking them up for some reason. He followed them for like a 100 yards, and at the very end, there was a circle of black candles with a hole in the ground that looked to be a grave. He brought all the candles home and my grandma yelled at him and made him throw them away. I 
I was canoeing into my hunting area a few years back. Came around a bend and saw some teenagers, maybe 20-year-olds walking down the train tracks. I waved hello and they proceeded to shoot a couple bullets in the river 40 yards in front and behind my boat. I have never been so angry in my whole life. I thought about going ashore downstream and sneaking up behind them to let a few bullets rip myself, but was afraid I might accidentally kill someone. This happened about two years ago on October 27th. I do a lot of hiking and I wanted to share with you all what is without a doubt one of the strangest things that I have experienced while hiking. While on the way back from the summit of Mount San Jacinto in California, a fairly popular trail, just as day was changing over to dusk about four miles and 20 vertical feet, a good two, three hour hike from the tram, we spotted a woman dressed in all black flapper attire with the exception of a white scarf. This woman was in dress shoes and carrying a very nice beaded purse. She was walking very intently and at a hurried pace up the mountain. If you're familiar with the hike, it's at the top of the Wellman Divide. Nearly without words, I asked her if she was lost, to which she replied. I'm on the trail, errant I. Her face looked gray and her lips were sort of blue. It was pretty cold outside. So as quickly as she had passed us, she was gone. My friend and myself looked at each other like, now we have seen everything. After conversations with other hikers on the way down that had also seen her, I was kiddingly remarking that I was sure we had seen some sort of ghost. Looking for a lost love much like the mysterious lady in black story folklore. It was a truly bizarre experience. About an hour later we were resting at Round Valley and we saw her again. Keep in mind, this is literally in the middle of the forest at 9,000 feet elevation. A good two hours hike from anything and the temps were around 35 degrees. The fact that it's so close to Halloween was not lost on me either. At any rate, I make no claims of the supernatural, but I'm not ruling it out. But I thought everyone might enjoy the story and the pictures of this truly strange encounter. I worked offshore for five years as an ROV pilot, the robots that go underwater. I have seen some odd things. Worked on a job where the field we were working on has barrels at bottom of ocean. We were told we couldn't go near these with a robot. Apparently these were dumped by the US government during Cold War era. Who knows what was in those barrels? I've seen all kinds of rare creatures, including exclusive six gill sharks. One of the cooler things I saw was an eel eating another eel the exact same size. Imagine a snake underwater eating another snake exact same size. That was pretty cool because it looked like the eel detached its jaw like a snake and everything. Also has seen giant bluefin tuna. Tuna in general can be anywhere from surface to a couple thousand feet down. The ability to dive like that still amazes me. I worked in the oil spill in the gulf. To see oil just pour out like that is something we have all seen, but to be there and realize that's just below you a mile below is something else. For me, it was crazy to see that many robots underwater at same time as you have usually max four two vessels, but rarely. It was chaotic as heck. The vessels out there were so close we could almost just have conversations with people by shouting, which is very rare. One of the crazy things I won't forget is two vessels were flaring off, literally just burning off oil, and I could feel the heat from their vessel on the one I was. I have whole stories I could talk about that really, but to be part of something that was that huge, even though it wasn't a good thing in our history, I can still say I was part of it and be proud to stop the spill. In January 1965, a group of musicians, including Jimi Hendrix driving back to Manhattan, were stranded in a blizzard and had gotten stuck in a heavy drift that reached the hood of their vehicle. It was bitter cold. Unexpectedly, the road ahead of them suddenly lit up as a bright phosphorescent object, cone-shaped like a capsule, landed in the snow about 100 feet up ahead. It stood on a tripod landing gear. Before any of the stunned occupants of the vehicle could move, a door opened on the side of the craft and an entity stepped out. 
He stood eight feet tall. His skin was yellowish, and instead of eyes, the creature had slits. His forehead came to a point, and his head ran straight to his chest, leaving the impression that he had no neck. The being proceeded to float to the ground and glided towards the trapped occupants of the van. The snow melted in the wake of the creature. His body seemed to generate tremendous heat, so much so that as it came across a small rise, the snow disappeared around in all directions. In a matter of what seemed like seconds, the being came over to the right-hand side of the van, where Hendrix sat, and looked right through the window. According to other witnesses at the scene, the creature seemed to be communicating telepathically with Hendrix. Immediately, the interior of their vehicle began to heat up. The heat coming from the being evaporated the snow enough to free their imprisoned van. The being glided behind the van and the snowdrift by now had completely vanished. Turning the ignition, the driver gunned the engine and drove away at high speed. As they looked back, they could see the road filling in with snow again. The object was at the same instant lifting off like a rocket from a launching pad. When a freak storm lashed the Gulf of Lyon and the inland villages were battered by winds of ferocious force, I was awakened by an insistent tapping on the window of my downstairs bedroom. At first, I dismissed it as the wind wrapping a twig onto the glass, but finally, I got up and went to the door with a lantern. A strange sight met my eyes. In the doorway stood a boy, aged about ten, wrapped in a piece of sacking. His hair was long and yellow, quite unlike that of the local boys, and his face almost luminously pale. He appeared to have no clothes apart from the sack, and as he stretched out his arms towards the light, I noticed that there were only three fingers on each of his long, slender hands. I stood there uncertain of what to do until my wife's voice roused me into action. She had come from the bedroom, taken one look at the strange tableau, and told me to bring the child into the house. She roused the fire in the kitchen, placed the shivering boy before it, and covered him with a blanket. He slept the night on a mattress in front of the fire. In the morning, my wife and I found him some clothes belonging to our oldest son, but it was soon apparent that he didn't know how to put them on. At first, I took him for some dumb waif, a simpleton, but it soon became apparent that he could speak, albeit in a language we had never heard before. Even the most commonplace things appeared to astonish him. He was bewildered by a cup containing warm milk and had to be shown how to drink from it. A knife and fork were complete mysteries to him. When a farm cat strolled through the door, the boy backed away, apparently in fright. My wife and I, totally bemused by our uninvited guest, told the story to the village priest, Father René Mouville, a retired Lyons University professor who had entered the priesthood at the age of 50. Once Father Mouville met the boy, he knew there was no obvious solution. The child was quite unlike any human he had seen before. Even the construction of his body seemed exceptional. His hips were extremely narrow, and his rib cage almost an inverted V-shape, quite the opposite of a normal chest structure. Just looking at those delicate, three-fingered hands made the priest feel a strange sense of foreboding. The next day, he took the child back to his house to be cared for by his housekeeper. He soon found that the boy had a fantastic intelligence. Unable to communicate by any form of language, Father Mouville began by drawing simple diagrams of everyday objects, which received no response. Then one day, he wrote down a series of numbers in the form of clustered dots. Immediately, the boy took the paper and pencil and began writing dots at high speed. When he passed back the paper, Father Mouville found that he had worked out the cube root and square roots of all the groups of numbers. As the weeks passed, my confidence grew. I began to master simple words and to go out with Father Mouville on his rounds. I began to be accepted in the village as almost ordinary instead of a curiosity. Basic physical phenomena fascinated me. I would sit for hours by moving water or watching birds in flight and the movement of clouds. It was as though I had never seen such things before. Then, after Christmas 19, I became ill. At first, the symptoms seemed to be those of a heavy cold and after a few weeks I seemed to have recovered. But by February I was sick again, 
this time with a high fever and a deathly pallor. A doctor was sent for and confessed himself mystified. My heart was the slowest he had ever heard, almost half the speed of a normal human. I should be taken to a hospital, but in my condition, such a journey could well have been fatal. So the boy who came from nowhere became weaker, and on the second week of March, I died and was buried under an ash tree in the graveyard of St. Mayan. I am from Waterville, Maine. Back in the late summer, early fall of 1971, I was newly married and living in Killeen, Texas with my husband who was in the army. We had a small duplex apartment in Killeen. One night he had duty and I was home alone in bed around 3 a.m. in the morning. I woke up suddenly and saw a black figure standing at the bottom of my bed. It was eight or nine feet tall and had huge big black wings and red eyes. I closed my eyes and opened them again, and it had moved closer to me on the right side of my bed. I couldn't scream. It was as if I was frozen in fear. I covered my head in the blankets. I was so afraid. About five minutes. Later I looked and it was gone. It gave me a horrible feeling and I prayed never to see it again. Shortly after this event I came back to Maine as I was way too frightened to ever stay alone at night when he had duty. I told my mom I had seen a huge black angel that night, and she was glad I came home as that didn't sound good. I had never heard of the Mothman, but a few years later I came across an article and a drawing of one. Even before I read the article I said, wow, that is exactly what I saw in Texas. It didn't have a noticeable neck and its face was like hooded, its wings tucked in on its side, but you could tell they were very large. It was totally black except for the eyes were round, large, and red. I still think of this thing with fear. Personally, do you have any idea what it is? I'm 57 now and I am still searching for an answer. P.S. The apartment I lived in had a well in the entranceway that always gave me the creeps. A cistern, I believe it is called. Just a flat rock covered it and it still had water in it. I couldn't see the water but I heard the plop when I dropped a rock in it. This probably has nothing to do with any of this, but felt I should tell you anyways. My cousin did a lot of forest surveying in some pretty remote areas in British Columbia, Canada. He and a colleague were driving down an old logging road when a wit van passed them going the opposite direction. He said it was odd to see someone way out there, but not unheard of as hunters do use these roads. They went a few more miles down the road, got out and started doing some work and ended up finding a dead body with no head or hands. Freshly dumped as it wasn't decayed. They had to go back the same direction as the van. Luckily, they never crossed paths. They reported it to the RCMP and was told it was most likely biker gang related hit. I live a lot of my life in seclusion, though I spend a lot of time in the city as well. I tend to take the creepiest things with me to my home, and I've amassed a great collection of skulls and bones and various other items of morbidity. A few things I've experienced that might be of interest. Deep in the woods, I find a hole dug about three feet down. Around it, someone had constructed a rudimentary tippy out of shipping pallets, reinforced with greased rope and branches. A tarp was tangled over it, blown up by the wind. I peered in and found it recently lived in, freshly stirred dirt at the bottom. I lit the floor of the place with a flashlight and found a collection of undergarments belonging to young girls, all bright colors and cartoon characters, buried beneath a scree of dirt, rocks, and leaves. A duffel bag of loot was tucked in the back, mostly vitamin packets and detritus, empty liquor bottles, a man's bottoming out point, miles from civilization. The other place was near the grain silos, repurposed by the Salvation Army as an apartment complex for vagrants and mental patients. There was an old oil company, long abandoned and hollowed out, just over a set of train tracks and through a thicket of shrub grass. It was midnight or later and I was alone. Being closer to civilization, I did not want to attract attention. I made my way in the dark, Starlight and moonlight offered me a little guidance, 
though I was mostly beneath an overpass. I heard a rustling in the distance. I was too far in city for this to be a deer, and it sounded bigger than a turkey, which can be found basically anywhere. I had my knife out, and I stepped closer to the origin of the sounds. I heard a groaning, a muttering, gurgling sound. A growling. It was growing louder, and I was starting to make out syllables. Not speech per se, not words, but differentiated syllables. Just as the growling reached its zenith, I looked up and saw a man on a bike, pedaling down the sidewalk on the overpass above me. He had headphones on, and he was listening to death metal and growling along with the vocals. I was overcome with relief, but also awash with dread, because now I know why people don't talk to me when I'm on campus, because I do that exact same thing. I've also found some really strange signs out in the middle of nowhere. From memory, I can say that my two favorites are Uncle Bart Will F You Up and Outside an Old Slaughterhouse in Block Printed Scrawl. Cattle Operation Trailer Closed. Please do not dump. You will be seen. I'm sure I can think of more if anyone is interested. I'm a weird dude. I've lived in Lake Charles, born and raised, but in 2004, I moved to Alaska to be a youth pastor for a church. I was living in Seward and was invited to come and speak at a church in Fairbanks. About a nine hour drive. I'm from the South, not used to. I got there in January, this was in February. I took out on this trip by myself and had been given tips. This is where you want to stop. This is where you don't want to stop. Gas is real expensive here. Things like that. So I got out just north of Anchorage, north of Wasilla, up in that part of the country. There are people who have said that you stop and pick up hitchhikers. It's just kind of a thing. You don't really do it in Louisiana. Here it's life and death. If you see somebody on the road, you stop. So I saw a man walking north on the road and I pulled over. He got in the truck and I remember, just remember distinctly, he had a bit of a body odor smell. He smelled like a campfire. He was unshaven. His name, he told me, was Alex. He spoke with a Russian accent, and he said he was a mountain climber, and he said his favorite place on Earth was the top of Mount Everest, and that he was in Alaska to climb Mount McKinley. So he was on his way to Denali Park. He rode with me in the car for about two and a half hours, asking me about why I was there, about my calling and feel on my life, those types of things with me. He gave me tips about driving on the ice, told me not to do things that would have caused error. We came to a town called Trapper Creek. I don't know if you are familiar with it. I was not going to get gas there. It was one of the places I was told not to get gas there because the prices will kill you there. He said, you'll want to stop here because the weather is too bad. Denali is going to be closed, and so I said, okay. He had been in the car for two and a half hours, we talked extensively about Everest and his plan to see the top of Mount McKinley. Well, we stopped. I got out, started fueling the car. He grabbed his small backpack that he had and walked into. I saw him walk into the gas station, the little junction station, had a little cafe in it. He walked through the doors. When I finished filling up, I went in to use the restroom, pay and grab a bite. I asked the clerk, I said, Where's the man that just walked in and she looked at me and said, You're the only one that has been here for hours. I said, No, a man just walked through these doors. We spent 20 minutes walking around the back of the building. We followed the tracks, the two sets of tracks back to the truck. He was nowhere to be found. There was icy wetness where he had been sitting in the truck. The truck still smelled like him, so at that point, I've chalked it up to, Was it a ghost or was it an angel? I don't know what. I wouldn't have had enough gas. And when I got to Denali, that gas station was indeed closed. To begin, I'll admit that we were hiking, not hunting. I was with my brother-in-law. In the Appalachians, it's usually snowy in December, but that year it was a constant 40 female or so, and too foggy to see very well. We made our way into a dense rainforest area and found what looked like an extremely overgrown, 
rarely trodden erosion forming a path. This didn't make sense. It was on the back of an inconvenient mountain peak very craggy, and not on the way to anywhere, not even another trail. So we followed it. The deciduous canopy lay rotting on the winter ground, but little sunlight broke through anyway due to the deep fog and mountain shadow. It felt haunted. We descended into a hollow with a small creek at the bottom and rounded a bend into a dense clump of rhododendron. Inside this rhododendron brush, we started to see weird things like decaying rope, rusted metal, paracord, and supplies. Then the trail ended. Between two oak trees that formed a window through the brush, we could see a rusted body of metal with face-sized holes of glass on the sides. We made out the shape of a small plane from the scattered pieces. The body was only in two pieces, but the wings were unrecognizable. There was a bit of graffiti on the plane, but not as much as you would expect. It had clearly been there for a while, but some of the original gear was still in the body. I wrote down the number on the side for reference. When I got home, I googled the plane number and found a result. Accident Report March 1977, Western North Carolina Damage Beyond Repair One Passenger One Fatality Body Recovered Plane Unsalvageable We found the plane in 2016. That wreckage had been left to rot for 39 years, and some of the gear still had not been stolen. I know it was only one death, but that place had a deeply unsettling aura. I am not superstitious. I do not believe in ghosts, but there was something strange about that place, and I won't forget it. I didn't crawl into the plane's body, both out of fear and because I wanted to be respectful to whoever died there, but I did take pictures of it all from the outside. To give you some context, in 2021 I got my first job as an order picker in a food processing company. Being a very unsocial person, I managed to negotiate with my boss to work with a small night shift 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. It's quite ridiculous because there's nothing good about being an order picker when you compare it with other jobs, but for me it was heaven. I could work on my own without having to interact with other people. One evening, my father dropped me off in front of the company at 9 p.m. and left. He couldn't take me any later because he was too tired to drive any later that night. So I sit down on the ground next to the building and start lighting up a cigarette and hanging out on my phone. A few minutes later, a man emerges from the darkness, well-dressed and well-groomed and carrying a rucksack. He walks over to sit on the ground next to me. At the time, he looked like an ordinary employee, so I thought he must have forgotten a file and come back to get it. But the strange thing was that the building was still open, so the man could have gone straight in to get his papers. When I remembered, I was really scared and wondered what this man wanted and why he was sitting so close to me. Being paranoid by nature, I imagined all sorts of creepy things he could do to attack me. But fortunately, he didn't do anything. He just sat there and didn't move an inch, as if he'd become a statue. After several minutes of silence during which I stressed, and he did literally nothing, it was 9.50 p.m. So I entered the building, and the man did the same. I was even more worried, but then I remembered that the building had security cameras, and that reassured me after all. Why would he attack me in the building which is secured by cameras when outside there were none? I made my way to the changing rooms to change into my prep outfit and saw that he'd taken a different one that led to the offices. This reassured me a little as it confirmed my theory that he was just an employee. Throughout my evening at work, I thought about this man and couldn't stop wondering why he had waited on the floor with me. One of the most likely scenarios I thought of was that he probably thought the door was closed and that I was waiting to be let in and that by instinct he just sat down and waited with me without saying anything. For most of my shift, I was alone in my area and continued to work, except that at one point I heard a man coughing and turning around, I saw him. The man stood there, straight as an eye, staring at me. When I noticed he was staring at me, I jumped up and asked, can I help you? But the man said nothing and continued to stare at me blankly. After about two minutes, which seemed like hours, he walked towards me. 
My instincts were screaming at me to run away from this man, but I couldn't, I was stunned, and when he was less than two meters away, he put his hand in his pocket. I thought he was going to pull out a knife or something and stab me, but instead he pulled out a pack of cigarettes, still intact, handed them to me and walked out. It was the same brand as the one I'd been smoking, but it didn't belong to me, for the simple reason that I buy my cigarette packs individually, and once this one is empty, I go and buy another, but I never buy several packs at the same time. What's more, he could never have known what brand it was, since I didn't take my pack out in front of him. After that, I never saw him again. I moved to another area that evening to talk to other colleagues, but they were dubious about my story. I also tried to tell my superiors, but they didn't believe me either, because you need an access card to enter the building and according to them, if this stranger was able to get in, he probably had one. The problem was that I was the one who opened the door, and the man simply walked through before it closed. Nevertheless, I continued to work there until the end of my contract, but I still don't know who this man is or what he wanted from me. Why did he sit so still next to me that night? Why did he follow me into an employee area? Why did he watch me for so long without saying a word? And why did he give me that unopened pack of cigarettes? My dad spent years at sea and has many stories from his time on tanker ships as an engineer. One time the ship was being slowed down by something they couldn't explain, mechanically fine. Turns out they had a large dead whale wrapped around the bow of the ship, slowing them down. But the creepiest story was a simple one. The crew was shark fishing off the bank of a smaller tanker ship, basically attaching meat chunks to hooks and throwing them off the back to trawl in the ocean southeast of Sea Australia area. My dad for fun made up this large steel alloy, described it as being incredibly durable hook to use. They attach a large chunk of meat to it and throw it off the back. A while later they haul it back in, only to find the meat is gone and the hook is bent completely straight. There was nothing it could have snagged on in the deep ocean as the boat was driving through. My dad and the crew were sufficiently unnerved to think that something large down there could bend a large hook like that. Yesterday I took my son fishing. He wanted to go to a nearby lake that we haven't been to in quite some time. It's not known to be a great area. For some background, the last time we went, about a year ago, a car drove by and screamed, nice ass, at me while I stood there with my young son. This kind of garbage behavior is unfortunately expected in the area. It's also known to be a late night hookup spot as well as a late night drug deal location. Due to the lake's reputation, I had made a deal with my dad that I wouldn't stay there past 4 p.m. without him. On to the story. My 12-year-old son, who looks much younger than he is, and I pulled up at our favorite fishing spot, a small pond on the opposite side of the road as the lake. Almost immediately, an older gentleman approached us asking if there were fish in the pond. I replied that we had just gotten started, so nothing yet, but that we had caught fish in the pond on plenty of other occasions. He thanked us for the information and returned to his spot on the other side of the road. About 15 minutes later, another younger man approaches the older man with a dog. I can see and hear them chatting, but they've made no move to involve us in the conversation, which I'm glad for. I just want to enjoy a day with my son. Unfortunately, the water in the pond was incredibly low and murky, and I could tell we weren't going to have any luck. I tell my son to pack it up and we'll try another spot on the other side of the lake. As we begin packing our gear into the trunk, the younger man yells over, sorry if my dog and I ran you off. I tell him it's no problem, and we were simply moving to a better fishing spot. He then starts telling me how nice it is to see a mom taking her kid fishing, how you don't see that very often, etc. I get this a lot, so I'm pretty used to it. We have a short conversation about it as I pack up, and I then move towards the driver's side doors to depart. Before I can leave, the younger man starts up another conversation, this time asking me how old I think he is. This feels strange to me, but I'm nice to a fault sometimes, 
so I answer his question. I tell him I'm a horrible judge of age, but maybe 25. He tells me he's 38 and I'm too kind and I laugh it off saying something like, I work with teenagers, so they always guess me well above my age just to be mean. He asks where I work and I stupidly tell him my city. Turns out he lives there too and starts going on and on about how he got a free apartment on such and such street because his baby mama kicked him out of their house. I think he's talking about some kind of government assistance program. Weird flex, but okay man. At this point, I'm standing by the car door with my hand on the handle, and my son is already in the back seat. This guy can't take the hint and starts telling me all about his awful baby mama and how women are supposed to be submissive, quiet, and do what they're told. He specifically said, I mean it's cool that you can bait a hook or whatever, but you're still a woman. Now my alarm bells are blaring. This guy struck up a conversation by commending me for doing a typically dad thing with my kid. Now he's putting me down for the same thing. He's gone from being overly friendly and complimentary to agitated and ranting. I should have been rude and just got in the car and left. But I've unfortunately been conditioned, like many women, to be polite even when we're uncomfortable. Instead, I start making comments in the hopes he'll see I'm not some meek submissive woman who's going to agree with him. After all, I'm a tatted up chick with an eyebrow piercing and two lip piercings. I don't exactly look like a submissive little housewife. I guess I was trying to make him just as uncomfortable as he made me in the hopes he'd leave me alone. After he says women shouldn't be loud or opinionated, I tell him, oh, well, you wouldn't like me at all. He tries to backpedal saying, I mean, it's okay to be loud, I guess, but don't try that with your man, you know, I say. My man doesn't tell me shit. I do what I want. This kind of back and forth goes on for a while before he finally shakes his head and says, I just don't understand what kind of woman would act like that. I reply, a strong one. As soon as the words left my mouth, the older gentleman yells from his spot on the bank, Yeah, say that again, honey. This distracted the creep long enough for me to hop in the car and lock the doors. I still don't feel safe though. Unbeknownst to Creepazoid, only two of my car doors actually have functioning locks, but at least they're the two on his side. I put the key in the ignition and turn. No dice. Nothing. Of all the times for my car to act up, it chooses now. Panic has now set in. As I repeatedly try to start my car, I can see him out of the corner of my eye. He's taken notice of my car troubles and is trying to get my attention. As he takes a few steps towards my car, the engine finally roars to life and I peel out of there. Only then do I let my composure crumble and have a long talk with my son about what just happened. To the older gentleman who took notice of my discomfort and provided a distraction, I'd gladly meet with you again any day. To the younger, misogynistic creep, I don't know if I was actually in any danger from you, but my gut said I was. Let's never meet again. Oh, and to my dad, I'll make you a new deal. I'm never going to that lake alone again, regardless of the time of day. Probably too late chime in and not me, but back in the 70s my father used to fly freelance charter jobs. One job was flying a dead guy to his funeral destination. On the way there, he ran into some bad weather. Turbulence ensued. He started hearing a strange sound, a human sound. The dead guy behind him was gasping, moaning. Sounded like a forceful her, her. Before you start thinking the dead guy wasn't actually dead, he was. The rough turbulence was forcing air out of the cadaver's lungs, producing the sound. This is a true story I long awaited to share with your community. So last month I had another encounter with Bigfoot. I was out elk hunting near the Oregon coast, exploring the mountains behind Cannon Beach. I had reached the area near Grassy Lake, accessed by Buchanan Creek Road, just past the fish hatchery. As luck would have it, I had spotted a herd of 25 elk emerging from a thicket and managed to shoot a bull. After gutting and quartering the elk, 
I decided to do some further exploration in the vicinity with my 1989 Ford Escort. Having some time to spare, I grabbed my fishing pole and began ascending towards Grassy Lake. However, before I could get too far away from my car, I heard a strange sound coming from about 250-300 yards away. Curiosity peaked. I noticed a distinct hump amidst a grove of young Christmas trees, about eight half feet tall. Intrigued, I returned to my car to retrieve my rifle and peered at the hump through my 35 power scope. To my surprise, I observed a hand rising up, pushing one of the trees down. At that moment, I thought I was merely witnessing the rear end of a bear. I continued observing for about an hour and a half, convinced that the bear was unaware of my presence. As a light rain mixed with snow began to fall, I grew somewhat bored and decided to honk the horn of my car. Instantly, the creature's head shot up, towering a foot and a half above the trees. It was then that I realized I was looking at another one of those things. After scanning its surroundings, the head returned to its previous activities, completely disregarding my presence. Another half an hour went by, and the creature remained motionless. I decided to walk up the road behind the Bigfoot on a cliff to get a closer look at what it was doing. The creature was chattering, emitting deep, hollow noises resembling pig grunts. Even from a distance of 150-200 yards, I could see its hands engaged in some sort of activity. I noticed another white truck passing along the road, engaging in what appeared to be road hunting. Sensing the approaching vehicle, the Bigfoot lowered itself to the ground until the truck had passed, and then it rose back up. Frustrated by the interruption, I fired a rifle bullet into the air. Startled, the creature's head snapped back up, its gaze frantically searching the surroundings. It locked eyes with me, seemingly unbothered by my presence, as if it couldn't care less who saw it. The creature continued flipping its arm upwards, chattering and stomping its foot, as if urging me to leave. To further deter it, I fired a second round. It shot me a disdainful look before finally departing, sprinting towards a nearby hillside ridge with astonishing speed. It effortlessly traversed the mildly rough terrain in a mere minute and a half before disappearing into the steep Oliver Canyon. The ravine, with its 200-foot depth, provided me with a glimpse of the creature as it moved further into the distant forest, eventually vanishing from sight. Intrigued, I descended to investigate what the Bigfoot had been doing. To my astonishment, I discovered a dead coyote caught in an animal trap. The coyote's neck was broken, with a pool of blood and scattered coyote hair surrounding it. The creature had devoured the entrails and rear half of the animal, leaving only the head and front legs behind. Perhaps if I hadn't scared it away, it would have finished its meal. Coyote hind legs are said to be particularly tender, while the front legs are more muscular. As darkness settled in, I made my way back, planning to return the next day. When I returned to the site the following day, I discovered 24-inch long footprints left behind by the towering 10-foot tall Bigfoot. Additionally, I found 10 strands of 5-inch long hairs clinging to a tree branch. As I reached the base of the 200-foot ravine where the Bigfoot had made its impressive jump, I encountered two deep footprints embedded in the soil. Intrigued, I decided to follow the creature's trail back into the hills. The path exuded a sweet, putrid stench reminiscent of something deceased. Eventually, I stumbled upon a cave, fairly spacious inside, with a pool of water sourced from a nearby spring. It appeared as though something had slept there, though I couldn't rule out the possibility of it being a bear's den. This story takes place in August of 2013 in the mountains of Southern Oregon. I am a USAF Security Forces Airman Military Policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick, another military cop, and I decided to go explore some back roads and get out of the heat in town. Southern Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used, and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days off starting on roads that we knew, finding roads we didn't know, driving for hours into the mountains, 
eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road we had never been on and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for around an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of other people in the woods. We rounded a bend in the thick fir woods and emerged in a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds, hardly any insect noise, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the Aspen Grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out of the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about five feet five, regardless, the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed he was looking back into the aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of color that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small one-man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet from the strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread, and felt certain that there was someone in the tent, and if we could see the tent, they could see us. There were no campgrounds in this area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely someone camping so remotely would be, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement or hear any sounds coming from it. Nick suggested I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? I yelled. No reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area. But we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in the tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it all the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the camp. Should we need to leave in a hurry, he would be waiting behind the wheel. With my heart pounding, I started walking through the trees towards the tent. I was totally keyed up with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over. No fire had been built, no wood collected. The tent. The tent was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave and tell Nick what I had seen. As I left, I heard Nick start yelling. Let's go. Let's get the F out of here. Not knowing why he was yelling, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat-up old Ford Taurus on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat, and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men. A third person was laying against the window in the back. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way we had come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the, the highway without seeing the car again. I still do not know if the person in the back was male or female. I called the state police, and they promised to send a trooper out to check out the scene. However, I received a call the next day from a trooper stating that the campsite, the backpacks, and the women's clothing was all gone, though he could tell people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove. I have not returned to the area, and do not intend to. This story is my husband's and occurred in the 1970s. He was erecting fences with a mate in rural Springbrook 
which is in the Gold Coast hinterland about 70 kilometers south of Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. There's a very hilly region with dense rainforest. They were cutting a fence line when they smelled a horrible stench and heard a noise that sounded like a combination of a pig grunting and a dog growling about 20 meters away. They couldn't see anything due to the dense bush. My husband turned to his mate, who was a big man, to find him already running full speed in the opposite direction. He then took off after him. They returned to the job two days later after stopping at the forest ranger station on the way to ask him if there had been any reports of wild boars in the area. The ranger laughed and said it was possible, and then told them that part of his job was to keep the walking and hiking trails clear of weeds and brush. He'd walked the trails with a machete looking just ahead of him at his feet and clearing any unwanted vegetation when he smelled a stench and the hairs on the back of his neck stood up. Looking up, he saw a bipedal brown hairy creature staring at him about 13 meters ahead. He froze and stared at it until it turned and disappeared into the thick scrub. My husband and his mate continued on to the fence job, but did not hear, smell, or see anything again. A few years later, they were working in a similar landscape near the location of the previous encounter. They had heard from several local farmers who had heard similar noises to what they had heard previously and who had seen a hairy bipedal creature run into their paddocks, grab a sheep or a calf, and then run back into the dense forest. There are Yowie researchers who have had similar encounters and have taken thermal images of a large bipedal creature. We know they exist. When we get the chance, my father and a few of his friends go camping up in Baxter State Park in Maine. For anyone who doesn't know, it's a pretty secluded section of the state and pretty much everything surrounding the park grounds is also wilderness. While up there, we took a hike to some fishing ponds buried deep in the woods. The trails were mostly overgrown, and the destination was a place that you really had to be in the know to find it. My dad's friend who was accompanying is a native Mainer and knows lots of secret fishing spots like that. Needless to say, not too many people walk those trails and the closest town is hours and hours away. Well, anyways, my dad's friend starts talking about this old store in the woods he remembered from his childhood. He said fishermen in the area knew about it, and you could get bait and ice and few other minor conveniences. He said he hadn't been there since childhood, but faintly remembered it being somewhere near where we were. I remember thinking it was bullshit, just a made-up story my dad's friend is a charming guy but he's known to tell some tall tales. Considering how far out in the wilderness we were, I thought it was absolutely ludicrous for any store or any other human for that matter to be nearby. I mean, the closest road you could take a car on was about two hours from where we were on the trail. But sure enough, about 45 minutes later, we come to this pond and the trail forks. My dad's friend just says, this is it, this is the path to the store. I remember it. So he starts walking down one of the paths, which extended a good ways about half a mile around the perimeter of the pond. We get to a clearing in the woods and it just opens up into this huge field with about 10 of what appeared to be houses or living compounds. It slightly reminded me of that town specter from Big Fish. I was absolutely shocked to see any trace of humanity. If you know the area of Maine I'm talking about, you would be too. The place was completely empty but none of the buildings looked run down. The whole property was definitely maintained. We started to walk around, and after a couple minutes, this really old guy with a thick Maine accent came out of one of the houses, and my dad's friend went up to talk to him. Turns out the store was real, and we bought some ice and left. I half expected to hear the Twilight Zone theme when I saw this place. Not really creepy, but very mysterious. I'm still shocked that such a strange random place like this exists in the world, and I still have so many unanswered questions to this day. Why so far out in the middle of nowhere? What were all the other buildings for? Where was everyone else? How does this one guy live two hours from the closest road and survive, let alone get any business? I was 61 years old when I had the most unusual encounter of my life. 
I'm an unassuming man, steady and phlegmatic, with a thick brush of white hair and a craggy outdoorsman's face. I enjoy a pint and a dram, but I never indulge when I'm working. I've spent my entire adult life working as a forester in the Ditchmont Woods located in Livingston, West Lothian, Scotland. On the morning of Friday, November 9, 1979, I set off with my red setter Lara to check the woods on Ditchmont Law for stray sheep and cattle. It was a damp day, and as I parked the van and set off down the forest track, the noise of the Edinburgh-Glasgow motorway was muffled by the thick, dark fir trees. The dog ran ahead, and my trudging Wellingtons made the only sound. Then, as I turned a corner into a clearing filled with light, I saw it an unidentified flying object UFO. The object had a dark gray color, and its texture was like an emery board with small, brighter, highlighted areas against a darker background. The appearance of the exterior seemed to change, as if the UFO was attempting to camouflage itself. I estimated its size to be around 18-20 feet in diameter and about 12 feet high. It looked as if it was mounted on a ring, resembling a hat with a brim. There were also protruding stems topped by propellers on the outside of the craft. Nothing on the object was moving at the time. Suddenly, two small spheres rushed at me. They were like miniature versions of the large craft, making a sound as they approached, with spikes on the outside making contact with the ground. They stopped by my side and attached themselves to my trousers, dragging me back toward the UFO. I was overwhelmed by an extremely strong smell, causing me to struggle for air, and I soon lost consciousness. When I regained consciousness, the UFO and the smaller spheres were gone, but Laura, my red setter, was still with me. She was unsettled, running around and barking madly. As I tried to call out to her, I realized I had no voice. I couldn't stand either. Eventually, I crawled back the way I had come for about 300 feet. Gradually, I was able to stand up and walk back to my pickup truck. I attempted to contact the forestry headquarters using my two-way radio, but found that my voice had not yet returned. I tried to drive back home in my pickup truck, but it got stuck in the mud. So I began the long walk back to my house, which was approximately a mile away, and finally arrived at 11.15 am. My entire experience had lasted just over an hour. By the time I reached home, my wife was shocked to see my condition covered in mud with torn pants. I began telling her the story of what had happened. She wanted to call the police, but I was against it, considering the subject matter. However, I allowed her to call my job supervisor, Malcolm Drummond, and inform him about the incident. While she made the calls, I took a bath to clean up. Drummond, being eager to find out what had happened, called a physician and immediately drove to my house. He questioned me while I was still in the bathtub. We both agreed that there must be some kind of physical evidence left on the ground by either the craft or the small spheres, so we headed back to the area to investigate. However, Drummond couldn't find the exact location. Dr. Gordon Adams arrived and examined my condition. He found grazed areas on my left leg and under my chin, but no apparent head injuries. At that time, my body temperature, blood pressure, and other functions seemed normal. Adams called for an ambulance to take me to the hospital for a head x-ray and a counseling session. However, I decided to postpone the hospital visit as I had planned to visit relatives over the weekend and didn't want to miss the trip. Word of the encounter spread, and soon the press caught wind of it. By Sunday, the incident was known all over the United Kingdom, and within a week, it had gained worldwide attention. The story was featured in television documentaries, magazines, and books. Even the company I worked for erected a plaque at the site to commemorate the event, although it was later stolen. The local police, inexperienced in dealing with UFO cases, didn't discount my description of the incident. They took testimony from me, my wife, and Dr. Adams. Due to the assault involved, they sent my clothing from that day for forensic examination. A cursory overview revealed torn pant legs at the hip area, and traces of a powder were found. However, it turned out that the powder was just maize starch transferred from the bag used to send in the trousers. 
The police also investigated any flights that might have occurred that day, but found no evidence of planes, helicopters, or any other equipment in the area. The ground markings, consisting of two parallel ladder-like tracks with holes, confirmed that something had been on the spot I indicated. I was well respected by people in the area, and there was no reason to believe I would hoax such an incident. I had a history of illnesses and surgeries, but there was nothing in my medical records suggesting head injuries or psychosis. I know what I saw, I insisted. My firm belief in my story led the police to open a criminal investigation for assault, making it the only such case in Britain arising from a UFO sighting. The investigation remains open. My neighbors, however, were more skeptical, and eventually, I decided to move away to an undisclosed address. Nevertheless, I became the most famous witness to aliens in Britain. My trousers were analyzed by psychics at spiritualist meetings, and on the anniversaries of the sighting, UFO spotters would gather in the clearing, hoping for another encounter. The aliens didn't stop there. Since that November day, West Lothian skies have been filled with glimmering disks, strange lights, and bouncing fireballs. The Falkirk Triangle now records around 300 UFO sightings a year, more than any other place on Earth. The Forge Restaurant in Bonnybridge, where fireballs sail over the trees and wingless planes are seen in the fields, has become a hot spot. Some experts suggest that West Lothian may be a thin place, offering a window from Earth into another dimension. If we accept my account as true, I was abducted by something otherworldly for about 20 minutes on November 9, 1979. No evidence has emerged to disprove my story. I was respected by those who knew me, and I never sought to profit from my alleged experience. Normally, I get off work right around 10 p.m. This was at night when I saw this. I'm also going to leave my name out of this just in case it could hurt my law enforcement credentials. I don't know what I saw, but it was some sort of canine. I was driving down an isolated road that leads to one house on the other side of the hill. I haven't seen any cars or people on this road. It's more of a way for me to get home quicker without having to go all the way around by using this nifty shortcut. But as I'm coming up the hill on my way home, something in the middle of the road catches my eye. Well, it was more so on the side of the road, trying to make its way towards the middle. Before I even had time to think about stopping or barely swerving, whatever it was was already up against my car with its front paws and claws up against the hood. This thing was huge. I slammed my gas pedal, hoping it would get out of the way, but I began hearing this little rumbling noise like this dog growling at me. So I got out of there fast. This thing went down on all fours from two and was now running alongside my car for a little bit before dropping back down behind me, disappearing into the darkness. Everything about this thing was huge. I can't get over it. It had massive legs and were just big. The entire body was big. Its head was huge. It had a very long snout and pointed ears. It looked kind of like a wolf, but different. The largest wolf I've ever seen. And those eyes, its eyes were from a whole other world. They were bright red. Thanks for listening to my story. Feel free to share it if you'd like, as long as you keep my name out of it. This happened about six months ago. Bit of background, I've grown up on boats and beaches. Family have always had a boat and I have always fished. However, this story didn't happen when I was out in the ocean. I was at a friend's house just after the moon had risen. It was a fairly bright night as I was sitting with a group of friends on a beach house deck. Anyway, none of us had actually taken any drugs or started drinking yet. We had just gotten back to the house. I remember looking out at the view of the beach and the moon. The bright moon was shining a fairly wide path from just below it across the water and onto the beach, but all the other water was dark. You can imagine it like this. Although you could see the occasional wave break as the white wash caught some light. Anyway, I noticed a red light going from left to right. This is strange because a starboard green light should have been showing on that side of any boat at a cracking pace. 
like it looked like some serious type of speedboat flying. I pointed this out to my friends and a few of us noted how quick and smooth this boat was flying across the bay. It eventually moved near the light of the moon, and as we all watched it fly past, it was literally just a red light, like a giant red ball. As soon as it hit the other side of the moonlight, it disappeared. I kind of assumed it was a drone, but it was seriously quick. It disappeared and was a long way out skimming what looked very close to the water on a surf beach. If anyone actually got this far, thanks for reading. The names in the following account are changed to avoid criminal prosecution. Both I and the man who told me of the incident are holders of now inactive top secret clearances issued by Department of the Navy Central Adjudication Facility. I don't know if the details of the incident are still classified. This is why I've changed the names. I apologize in advance for the cryptic nature of the story. However, I have known this man I'll call in Jim and served in combat with him for many years. I have and will stake my life on his integrity. People have been misled to believe that these are animals so it's okay to kill them. Some time ago Jim was sent on a tad temporary additional duty to a unit in Alaska. Most of the time there was spent on field daying at this or that location sitting around and passing scuttle but rumors about the nature of their purpose there. The official title is simply security force training was conducted on target acquisition field navigation and winter survival alert drills were called almost daily. Jim and his platoon responded to the alert as always. Only this time the truck they had boarded started pulling out. He said they rode from 15 to 20 minutes to get out there in the middle of a huge valley, at which point they were told to follow an officer and a civilian guide. He and the others walked quickly at first for about a mile, and then were told to be quiet. They're also told to check their weapons standard M16s of fours, and one guy had an M40 and a 762 by 51 mm bolt action rifle. They were told they were there to kill an animal that was a threat to the compound and local residences. Jim told me that he had been on edge until that point because he didn't know what they were up against, but that a hunt for a bear or something was a relief. They spread out in a skirmish line and moved forward slowly and quietly with the guide about 20 yards in front of them. They had advanced that way about 150 yards when the guide stopped. They were just inside a tree line on the edge of a large meadow. As the line got to the guide, Jim said he saw what looked like a dark brown bear about another 50 yards into the meadow. The officer pointed to the bear and indicated that there was their target at that point. He and the others cycled the bolts on the rifles and took aim. That's when the bear stood up, only it wasn't a bear. He said it was about six feet tall with wide flat shoulders, not the sloping shoulders of a bear, and the legs were too long to be a bear. Its head was humped, and it had a long, and it had long arms It turned its head and looked at them. No one fired a shot. The thing grabbed something off the ground and started running away. That's when he saw the second one smaller, in his words about maybe four or five feet tall following the big one. They were quick too. The officer in charge hollered shoot and we opened fire. The first to go down was a smaller one. The big one stopped while still under fire and went back to the small one, dropped to a knee, and let out what Jim described as the cry of a mother over her dying child. I saw the hair on his arm stand up when he said, I kid you not. The rest of the story was told to me with his head down, unable to look me in the eyes. We stopped firing when the mother cried out, but the officer ordered us to kill it, so we resumed fire. The mother refused to leave the down child and took what he said was around 90 to 100 more rounds, and she finally went down. No one moved forward, but they stopped firing and reloaded. He said, we held our position for, I don't know, about 10 or so more minutes. That's when the officer started to walk toward it. The guy told him to stay there, wait, and give us some time to be sure it was dead. About an hour passed with no one talking, he said we couldn't even look at each other. My gut was churning the whole time and I wanted to throw up. Finally, the guide and the officer walked to the bodies and confirmed the kill. The rest of the platoon were not allowed to view the bodies, but were ordered back to the truck. 
On the way back to the compound, he saw other military vehicles heading toward the site, but they weren't from his compound. He said, I don't know where they came from. I mean, we were the only military in the area. Upon returning to the compound, he and the rest of the platoon were debriefed one by one and told not to talk to anyone about the mission under threat of a life sentence in Leavenworth. Both Jim and I are retired and both our wives have passed, so we don't have much to lose. It took a couple of shots of Jack Daniels and some other war stories to get to this one, but I swear every word is true. Jim doesn't lie and neither do I, and I'll have words with any man who says this didn't happen. People need to know these are not animals. They are just as human as you or me. I don't know how they came to be and I don't care. I just want people to know. I woke up to the sound of footsteps outside my bedroom door. My heart was pounding as I tried to listen carefully. The footsteps seemed to be getting closer. I was paralyzed with fear, wondering who could be walking around my house at this time of night. I quietly slipped out of bed and peered through my bedroom door, trying to catch a glimpse of whoever or whatever was walking around my house. But the darkness was too thick and I couldn't see anything. Suddenly I heard a loud creaking noise and I realized that someone was opening the door to my bedroom. I didn't know what to do. Should I run or confront the person? But as the door opened, I saw nobody there. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and my heart was racing even faster than before. I slowly walked towards the door, trying to be as quiet as possible. My hands were shaking and my mind was racing with fear and confusion. Was this a dream or was someone really in my house? As I stepped out of my room, I could hear a strange noise like a soft whisper coming from the darkness. It sounded like someone was breathing heavily right outside my door. My heart was pounding so hard that I couldn't think straight. I stumbled backwards and ended up falling down the stairs. I felt myself tumbling downwards, seemingly in slow motion, until I hit the bottom with a loud thud. I looked up to see a shadowy figure standing over me, and my heart stopped. I couldn't move or scream. The figure slowly started to take shape, revealing itself to be a person, but their face was completely covered. I couldn't see who it was, but I knew I was in danger. I tried to crawl away, but the figure caught up to me and reached out, grabbing me by the hair. I screamed in terror, but no sound came out. I felt like I was drowning in my own fear as the figure slowly dragged me towards my bedroom. That was the last thing I remembered before waking up in the hospital. The doctors told me that I had suffered a concussion, but I couldn't help thinking about who or what had come into my house that night. The memory of those footsteps, the whispers in the darkness, and the figure that had haunted my nightmares ever since has never left me. To this day, I still wonder what could be lurking in the shadows of my home, waiting to strike again. First time hunting, about six years ago in my early 20s. I was with two friends from high school that I hadn't seen in a few years. One of the guys, say his name is Freddy, had gone silent on me and my other friend, let's say Jacob. Freddy came back into town and went drinking with Jacob. Jacob calls me saying Freddy is back and wants to go camping. Turns into hunting pretty quick. Here's the weird part. Freddy had this unmistakable scar over his eye, like he'd been in a fight with a guy and like the movies. The knife was pressed down. I'd asked Jacob and he hadn't checked as to why. But we found out pretty quick the guy was nuts, so who knows. Freddy says he remembered hunting there with his dad. Mind you, we were supposed to be camping. He said the location was just up the way. A few shots of tequila and about five more just up the ways and Freddy stops. He looks back. I realize it's twilight and darkness is falling on us fast. Freddy, Jacob, I think this is where it happened. Jacob looks back at me bewildered. Jacob, what's that man, Freddy, where it almost killed me? About that time, the tequila buzz amped up and I laughed out loud. Turns out Freddy didn't like this and took off running. We try to catch up, but he's like gone, gone. 
So drunk Jacob and I had to pop open our easy setup tent and stay the night in Bumf, Montana. Jacob and I start talking about Freddy, his history, the I and where the F he went to. Throughout the night we heard what we thought for sure was him. Same cough and all. We start laughing about old times and must have passed out. I hear a zipper and see a dim light through the film of the tent. It's Freddy. Hey guys, get the F up. I'm freaking out. Buzz had worn off, but Jacob and I were totally confused. Freddy. My friend Sam doesn't believe me when I tell him I got friends. Or something to that effect. Sam turned out to be a deep woodsman from the back country. A true hillbilly hick in every sense. Dude smelled like compost and I couldn't see much of him, just silhouette. Jacob pulls a gun and tells them to F off. We get out, leaving everything behind. I was still a bit too drunk to process what happened. The sun comes up and we hit the main road again after what was probably two hours if walking. I sober up completely and Jacob tells me something that I still remember. He said he never drank the tequila, only I did, and that when I started rambling all weird, he knew Freddy had slipped us something. Freddy never had a friend with him, turns out I hallucinated it. I guess he had slipped me something that made me hallucinate all the conversations and everything. The one accurate part I got right was Freddy had taken off running, but it wasn't long. He came back, telling Jacob he led us out there to hunt us and wanted us to run. Jacob pulled his gun he had packed against my wishes and freaked old Freddy out, and he ran off for good. It was a rough end to what was a decent friendship in school. No telling what his scar was from and what happened to him, but we clearly lost all contact and I bought Jacob a real shot of tequila after we got back into town the next weekend. He saved me. The kicker was he didn't even have any bullets in the gun. He said he forgot to load it. Still freaks me out. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.